Hi, a very good morning to everyone. I'm Paige from the Culture Academy and I'll be your MC for today's webinar. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome to the Culture Academy's fifth online edition of the In Conversation With series. We have a great turnout of about 300 attendees today and also to our friends from overseas who are tuning in, a warm welcome to you. Our In Conversation With series offers an open platform for the arts and culture administrators, professionals and leaders to come together to present our work and their insights. This allows for more interesting discussions and also cross-pollination of ideas and sharing of best practices on issues that matter to the arts and culture sector. Today, we are very pleased to have with us Mr. David Chiu, Deputy Director, Festivals and Pressing Development of the National Heritage Board. And we also have Ms. Ignatia Nilu, Curator of Art Job, and Mr. Paul Tan, Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the National Arts Council. who will be sharing their views and insights on the topic of future-proofing festivals for the new normal a very relevant topic in this unusual time. And this session will be moderated by Ms. Cho Mei, Group Director, Conservation and Urban Design of the Urban Redevelopment Authority. Once again, please feel free to post your questions under the Q&A function uh, at any point of time, and our speakers will be able to address them during the Q&A session. Without further ado, I'll now hand the time over to our moderator, Ms. Cho Mei, to introduce the speakers. Cho Mei, over to you, please. Hi, good morning. Great to see more than 300 of you online today. I think we have in our audience many colleagues from the arts and cultural sector and also many colleagues from all many other institutions, um, including from the National Parks Board, National Library Board, Ministry of Education, and lots of many others as well. Um, I also see many students from our local art schools and our tertiary institutions as well as quite a few friends from overseas, from Indonesia, Australia, and Korea. I think it's uh, really wonderful that we have such a diverse group gathered here today. And I look forward to a very good discussion later on. We have with us this morning three distinguished speakers who will share with us their thoughts on how the ongoing pandemic has challenged us, but also inspired us to think about how we can reimagine our festivals in new and creative ways. We will first have David Chu from NHB, followed by Ignatia from Art Jock, Jakarta, and then uh, Paul Tan from NAC. Let me first introduce David. David is Deputy Director of Festival and Precinct Development at our National Heritage Board. He has been involved in Singapore's art and heritage scene for more than two decades in various roles. Currently, the Festival Director of the Singapore Fest, uh, Heritage Festival and also the Singapore Night Festival. David has taken the Singapore Heritage Festival online earlier this year, and I'm sure he has lots of stories and insights to share. So, David, please. Thanks, Cho Mei. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm David from the Festival and Music Development Team at the National Heritage Board. Uh, I've been in the role for uh, about one year, just over a year now. It's been a very eventful year, you could say, um, uh, primarily because of, uh, you know, the festivals team looks after two annual signature festivals at uh, NHB. Um, the first being the Singapore Heritage Festival, uh, which, which has been celebrating uh, Singapore heritage for the past 17 years. Uh, and of course, the Singapore Night Festival. Uh, which has been celebrating the night, and also all the museums in the Gras Basar uh, Lucas Precinct for 12 years now. So these are, you know, of course, very big scale uh, events. Uh, Heritage Fest usually reaches over about 1.5 million uh, people over three weekends. Uh, and the night festival, about 600,000 people over two weekends. So, you know, with COVID happening this year, uh, of course, we couldn't go ahead with the festivals. Uh, Form that, that they were in the physical sort of realm. Uh, so the Heritage Festival uh, became a fully digital experience uh, for the first time. Uh, and I have to say, uh, one that we converted in, in less than three months from a fully physical one. Uh, we went, uh, I would say, even to January or February this year. We were not considering this as an option. Um, but within three months, we converted it to a fully online experience. Um, the festival also happened during phase one, phase two, uh, and towards the end of uh, 
uh, the festival, the, the GE, the general elections, what also called. So, so I think we, you know, we can say we had impeccable timing. Now, uh, we, we managed to kind of like uh, I think we hit a lot of uh, interesting milestones during that time, and, and uh, we, we I think had both people's attention, but because people were stuck at home, but also um, there were a lot of other things going on as well. Uh, so many of our programs were existing content, you know, that we already had, and we were discussing with partners from last year, uh, which we then uh, adapted to an online format. Uh, for example, we had uh, guided tours of places, as you can see from the video documentaries uh, there, um, you know, guided tours of places and precincts, which would have been done in real life uh, for groups of people, different groups of people. We turned that into video documentaries. We put out also... Google map points of self-guided heritage trails so that people could experience the trail either at home looking at uh, you know the information on Google map or you could if you decided to venture and get some fresh air and exercise into a self-guided tour if you wanted to go out. Uh, I mean I think the numbers speak for itself there's definitely higher reach and increased accessibility as we all go online and digital but uh, I think uh, one of the, the key lessons that we've learned or we're thinking about now post uh, this year's first uh, experience in this is that we really need to examine closer, you know, the, the depth of engagement, the quality of engagement uh, when we go online. Um, you know, we, have, we are starting to ask ourselves in hindsight, yes, okay, we went online, but were we truly digital? What does it mean to engage audiences digitally? So today I'd like to discuss some thoughts, challenges, some lessons that, that we've learned and also we're thinking about from this experience and the future ahead for festivals in general. Uh, by the way, all of these programs are still online on the SHF website. So if you want to look at them, uh, yeah, it's one of the upsides of uh, going digital. So, I mean, what are some of these lessons, you know, we learned uh, from the first edition of SHF? And I think more importantly, the question we're asking ourselves is, why do we need to future-proof our festivals beyond uh, pandemic COVID situation? Um, these, I think, are some reasons. Uh, firstly, of course, you can't deny, I mean, all of us are looking at each other through the screen now. Uh, there's definitely a lot of screen fatigue. Uh, sure, you know, Digital Heritage Fest had over 80 programs online. Uh, but it also happened at a time when people were stuck at home, uh, already finding solace, entertainment, through their iPads, their TVs, you know, their mobile screens. Um, and they were also working, a lot of people who could work from home, work from home. So you, you know, constantly 24 seven, you were almost looking at a screen uh, the whole time. Uh, and I think also furthermore, at the same time, there were, there are also many similar offerings online as I'm sure many of you can attest to. Um, uh, for example, I asked myself, you know, the recent food festival, uh, are we similar? How different are we from the same food festival? So, I mean, to say that the screen and festival fatigue among audiences today is, is really an understatement. I think there's a need to really differentiate the experience, uh, digitally especially, uh, and more importantly, there's a need to, to value add and be impactful in the landscape, uh, which really brings me to my second point that, you know, one cannot ignore, I think, being in, in the experiential age uh, today, um, authentic experience, authenticity is, is really everything. Uh, especially if that experience is digital and virtual. Uh, at the end of the day, I think we've realized that uh, storytelling, you know, good human interest stories uh, really are what attract people to programs. Um, I think one program that I uh, remember very fondly in, in this year's uh, Heritage Festival was a small program, but a talk by, by Ethos Books, you know, with three authors, just speaking about their, their sharing about their childhood memories living in Tanjung Paga area. But because it was such a heartfelt, personal um, sharing, uh, you know, the responses to the talk was really overwhelming for days after that friends telling me how much they enjoyed it. And I think, you know, increasingly in the digital age where, where people are becoming more isolated from one another, uh, we all go online, but then we're increasingly further and distant apart. Um, festivals can and have become, I think, you know, that become the important place for us to connect with others, to build a community. Um, I think this year's Writers' Festival, for example, which Paul will, will probably touch on later, uh, does acknowledge this as well with uh, the theme that is looking at this year called intimacy. You know, we have been hearing about this const constantly, I would say, you know, and overwhelmingly, you know, visitor surveys 
for both the Heritage Fest and the Night Festival um, uh, in the years, uh, over the years. And uh, I, I think, you know, what we realize is that people come to the festival for social connection. Uh, people go to festivals to connect to each other, you know, to others in their social circle, to their surroundings, to their neighbors, to other Singaporeans. So even if a festival is digital, why should this change? You know, in fact, uh, one dare say that there's a huge potential of festivals going online. Um, and this year's Heritage Festival, for example, has also connected many Singaporeans uh, overseas. Uh, it was the first time that uh, many Singaporeans living abroad could participate in the festival. And, and even people of, from other countries, you know, interested in Singapore culture could tune in and converse with Singaporeans online as well. Uh, we, we thank our friends at STB and MFA, uh, the Tourism Board and Foreign Affairs for this. Uh, they shared our content uh, on their respective social media platforms and it accounted for some uh, 30% of our eyeballs. Uh, so thanks for that. I think last but not least, um, you know, part of the social and experiential nature of the festivals today uh, really means also that, you know, I think we, we hear that people want to be more involved. There is a potential to move you know, from a position of passive consumption to one of active participation or co-creation. Um, audiences are more engaged, you know, they're more involved uh, when there's an opportunity to participate, when there is a call to action, uh, especially when it's towards a social good. Uh, in this year's uh, Heritage Fest, for example, you know, we had, yeah, 1.8 million viewers, for example, uh, but um, in our top video, which is featured on this slide, a behind the scenes uh, immersive theatre piece uh, recorded you know, on, on the quite famous Everton Park, Tsiang uh, Gugui, uh, traditional business. I mean, aside from mere sort of passive viewing, how could we provide you know, for people opportunities uh, to support, for example, these businesses? Um, how do we get people to I don't know, purchase their products or even help spread the word, um, you know, even show people that, hey, there are avenues, if you're inspired by this, for you to, to do your own small heritage project. So I think the impact of festival really happens when it goes beyond you know, passive consumption uh, of its programs. There, I mean, there are a lot of books, writings, you know, articles out there now on how to future-proof one's business. Um, these are some lessons I think we distilled from, from really having to turn around um, a festival in three months. Uh, I think a change in mindset is definitely very important. Uh, instead of thinking short term, um, really being opportunistic, and, you know, but really how can we go beyond just reacting to COVID um, and move from, from a lens of say immediate success to one of a more long-term, longer horizon, you know, we were thinking, let's just not react to COVID. Let's think about, you know, using this opportunity to, to think take a long-term view of how to reposition the festival digitally. Uh, what does it mean to go digital in the long run? What does it mean to engage audiences this way uh, and to, to conceptualize programs this way as well? Um, I think secondly, it's also very important to articulate the role and the impact up front. Uh, in, in a time where there's so many offerings, right? So many digital offerings online, uh, limited resources. Uh, I think one of the questions we also asked ourselves as we went digital, we didn't do anything in the physical realm, then what is the festival for? What role does it play in the landscape? Who is the festival for? Uh, and this I, I really ask myself a lot. I think if the festival ceased to exist, you know, who, what would be missed? Would people miss us? You know, because this year we didn't go physical. So like, do people miss that? And I think it's important to identify and clarify this upfront so that you can prioritize the initiatives that you want, you want to focus on. Uh, I think well, because realizing that sheer footfall numbers don't make any meaningful sense anymore, especially in COVID times, um, you know, but really it's how successful a festival becomes relates back to this articulated role and impact. And if the festival achieves this uh, rather than just pure numbers. Um, I think assessing the future is also important. This entails all of us picking up skills, you know, and information gathering analysis for forecasting, be it for near or distant futures. I think as we all pivot digitally, uh, we realize that a lot more precise data uh, can be obtained, uh, can be collected. Uh, and also sometimes having a good partner who can do this is very helpful. 
uh, aside from doing our annual visitor survey, which we did online uh, this year, we also worked with SMU Arts and Cultural Management students who helped us survey festival goers, looking at the future audiences' needs and, and expectations and desires, looking at what sort of programming would resonate better with them. Uh, last but not least, uh, I think to be responsive, you know, after evaluating all the above, you have to be ready for a rapid response, uh, to be quick enough, to be open enough to act and want to change course. I think we experienced that, uh, we faced you know, ever-changing COVID restrictions, measures, conditions. At one point, the, the plans for the Heritage Festival uh, were changing on a weekly basis. Um, uh, but the team, I think, managed to adapt to each new situation, making sure that uh, really the essence and the experience of the festival would not be compromised, but would be practically uh, executed. And, uh, I think an example really is our theatre performances that we do every year. Uh, so as we went online this year, we worked with Cape Theatre to rework, you know, almost overnight historical narratives that were meant for stage uh, into a computer game that you see on the screen here, Dear Tanjong Panga. And it's uh, it's a stage sort of production that's been changed into a choose-your-own-adventure format computer game. So I mean, keeping the above in mind, uh, you know, what does this mean for, for festivals in today's fast-changing post-COVID world? What will be the new normal for festivals? Um, I would like to propose five key trends I think that we will see in the future of festival planning. Um, the first, I think, will be uh, looking at the gate, the gazing to the crystal ball, I think, a decentralization perhaps of how festivals are run. Um, you can't deny festivals are really big scale events with lots of people, uh, huge crowds of people coming through now with, with the pandemic on. Um, we will need to decentralize, you know, venues and, and you know, groups, big groups of people for the sake of safe distancing measures. Uh, but I think the long run, um, hey, could this be a new approach to festivals? Um, in an age, you know, where audiences are constantly seeking unique and authentic experiences, decentralizing the mass festival experience from macro to micro, perhaps may allow for more micro unique experiences. So instead, for example, this could mean instead of having one or two big festival villages, it could mean many smaller spaces that people can encounter. They can chance upon at random. It means, it probably mean a more flexible, less structured format uh, of a festival, allowing people to really you know, choose your own adventure rather than a few set routes and experiences. Uh, of course, with travel ban to place, you know, domestic tourism is also sort of all the reach down. Um, it gives Singaporeans an opportunity to rediscover, you know, uh, local areas, local communities more. But how can we ensure that this is not just during a time of travel bans to sustain this even after people are allowed to travel? You know, how can we go deeper locally to really rediscover Singapore to use the STB tagline that is, is on now? Uh, I think for us, you know, we, we sort of pilot or we tried this approach uh, this year uh, with one of our uh, video documentaries with the focus on past series. We work very closely with longtime residents like Mr. Summer, as you can see on your screen on the left here. Uh, you know, the end result of the documentary on, on past series was one, not just of historical facts, but I think it very meaningfully showed how the residents themselves saw the town that they lived in and they loved. So it's a very different take uh, on, on past years compared to the other uh, documentaries that we had on other places. And I think, you know, all of this, as well as with the digital technology that's available today, um, it does allow for more unique and customizable experiences. Um, in fact, I would dare say maybe it's the, to some extent, maybe the holy grail, you know, of uh, experience, the experiential Age today, uh, the ideal one being one that's customizable to the individual. Uh, so a festival can still exist as a big scale platform, but perhaps evolving to bring together a myriad of, of such you know like numerous uh, unique experiences, such, such that no one experience is the same for festival goers. Um, and I think you know, for example, the Heritage Festival typically has over a hundred programs, and you know, how do you select? How do you pick programs that? Uh, uh, you know, relevant to you that, are re that resonate with you uh, without being overwhelmed as well. 
I think customization also then creates that very personalized experience. Um, it gives festival goers more control and influence over the, the entire process. Uh, in some way, also, it creates a very collaborative experience with festival goers. I think going digital um, allows and makes this dream very possible. Um, Pitch It Here uh, is also our festival website, uh, which has a very, I think, very underutilized function uh, called My Fave, My Favorites, to, to bookmark programs that you want to check out. You know, think of it like adding uh, Netflix programs you like to your list you know, to watch. Um, and, and I think this is a very basic first step. And of course, much more can be done. Um, last but not least, I think to, to achieve enduring sustainable success, you know, long-term success, which is what we want to work towards. Um, this, I think, also means and also translates to very sustainable and enduring partnerships. Uh, partnerships, are, I think, key enduring partnerships are really made up of these factors. First and foremost is trust. Uh, and given uh, the very good re working relationship that Heritage Fest has built up over the years with its various partners. It's something that uh, we had with our partners this year uh, as we decided to, to take the leap of faith, you know, to, to go online in less than three months. Almost everyone said, yes, we sounded, you know, they trusted us to go like, well, really? Okay, let's, you know, we're all doing this for the first time. Let's, let's go, let's do it. Secondly, I think thinking longer term as well, you know, so not being opportunistic. Uh, I think, we, you know, we want to know that the partners uh, to let them know that they're growing with us as well and we also grow, the festival grows with them and i think it's also important to truly equip your partners with skills that they need to create impactful programming um, you know year after year they grow with you um, but and, and how can they create better programming every year year to year this takes time this takes time to develop this takes time you know to mature Finally, I think connecting our partners, you know, to one another, that's a very important role that the festival plays. How do you be the platform for like-minded partners to, to network and dream up new ideas and programs to come together among themselves to do this? Uh, for, for us, uh, for the Heritage Fest and for the Night Festival as well, I think this is identifying long-term strategic partners to the festivals you know, cultivating long-term relationships with each of them uh, in a way the festival then behaves a bit more like an institution uh, in this regard, uh, not unlike a museum who has long-term partners that it works with regularly for mutual exchanges and collaborations. Um, to conclude, I mean, taking all these things into consideration, I would say there are more wins than losses if you really think about it, how festival planning will and has changed post-COVID. You know, we essentially have to change our mindset to look at this. Uh, for example, you think about the, you know, some people have said, you know, performances, you lose a tactile experience. Um, but really now, I mean, as you can see, like, you know, you can see, you think about it, for performance, you can see the performance facial gestures, expressions up close, which you could probably not do in a live physical theatre setting. So if anything, I would say, you know, festivals are here to stay. Um, I would like to end with this quote um, from a film festival organizer uh, who was interviewed about the future of film festivals recently. You know, and, and he said, uh, and this really stuck with me, a festival's primary currency is intangible. It is buzz. Buzz is not a physical thing. It doesn't have to happen in a particular place or time. It can happen in many different ways. So I think the, the possibilities are really endless. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, we hope to see you for the 2021 edition of uh, the Heritage Fest. Thank you. Thank you, David, for sharing your thoughts. I think the importance of trust and partnership is really important. I think that's really what festivals are about. You know, getting people together to collaborate and uh, share experiences with one another. And you've also shared with us, you know, how the partnerships that you had enabled you to very quickly in very short time or three months transform and bring your event online. That must be quite an amazing experience. And thank you also for leaving us your thoughts on future opportunities to create, you know, much more bespoke, personalized experiences. And I think that is a, a topic that we can maybe spend a bit more time to talk about later on. To our audience, uh, please do feel free to keep the questions coming in as you listen to the speakers and uh, we can have a good discussion later on.
Now let me introduce you to our next speaker, a very special guest from Indonesia, Miss Ignatia Nilu. She's a writer, curator, and cultural producer, currently a curator of Art Jock, an international contemporary art festival in Jakarta, and also Art Bali, an international art festival in Bali. I'm sure we're all very excited to hear about experiences and learn uh, more about the scene in Indonesia. So please let me invite Ignatia. Ignatia, please. Good morning. Um, and thank you, Chome, and also David for the previous presentation. Uh, I'm glad to be joined in this uh, webinars and, and sharing how we as our job uh, has to overcome the situation and to create a new platform during this um, time. And I was preparing uh, a videos uh, for us. Contemporary Festival uh, based in Yogyakarta. Um, yeah, we we understand and we deal that the situation we have to surpass the situation as the milestone, not only us as our job as an event or institution, but also our job as part of the festival that represents Jogja or Yogyakarta itself. As a figures of the factory or end force of the arts and cultural event in Indonesia. And as we know, Yogyakarta has very special places as production space for the arts. And we are the, we are the factory to creating artists, curators, alternative spaces, events, uh, experiments, and discourse also. And they are a landscape of art and cultural practice that we can see through the trajectories of diverse festivals in Yogyakarta as we've seen in the festival. There's dances, um, performance. Also, there's a lot of traditional arts festivals. Also, like some media art festival, like Sumonas, the video mapping festival, cell button, and etc. And and this this moment, uh, those festivals is sit together and they and and they work and collaborate under Jogja festival. Also, even a very experimental festival is like Jogja Noise Bombing, which they are playing very experimental noises music. Also like custom fest here. So we can see like there's a diverse festival going on in the city. And through the global pandemic happening since the end of 2019, uh, we have to see that there is a very significant impacts uh, of COVID-19. And this year is remarking our 13th edition of Arjo, uh, which we already said before that uh, 2020 actually could be should be the implementation of the edition of Arts in Common, which is our trilogy of uh, three years edition, starting from uh, common space and common time and then common sense. That's our big theme for the next three years. But then we understand since the global pandemic, we have to shift our strategy. And therefore, uh, there is no longer possibility to implement the former idea during the situation. However, we have to admit that the regulation or the head protocols in will be the big challenge uh, for us. And this trigger us to recreate a new way of 
seeing or visioning the presentation of arts and artwork from the artist. Um, and this is like um, the, the present edition of our job this year. Um, and also the exhibitionary has become the established platform before and therefore we have to explore or expanding how we work or rework our art drive in such an efficient way. We can see that uh, as a festival, our job is not only the exhibition of artworks or place for artists to present in their artworks, but our job itself is the art space. And this challenge triggers us to research uh, what can still be maintained uh, and what we can, what we have to change. And some tactical aspect in this exhibition show us that it's still important to look at painting as it is and not to shift painting to pixelated or animated video it means that we don't want to transfer all that uh, we present in the former uh, museum shifted into all in the digital uh, medium. And that uh, is a little sample that gives us a power button to installing an actual space and exhibition still during this pandemic instead of uh, also we are recreating those platform in, in a virtual uh, exhibition. And we understand that exhibition and the festival is not longer the same anymore and we want to expand our platform in the new sensation. That's why we are launching a, a new platform. It's called Expanded Art Job. It's a cinematic version of, of the exhibition uh, that we, we do uh, to overcome the situation. And uh, we want to prove that we don't uh, want to, we cannot find the answer now or, or how we have to creating a new strategy of the festival because we still believe that space um, still be the same uh, and expanding the digital space is uh, additional space for broader audience can responding and um, everyone can access from their home. And, um, but we believe that we can do, uh, that this is the collaboration and all the solidarity is the power to overcome the challenge. And this is already the resilience itself, why we believe that resilience is the good team for our edition this year. And also resilience is the message to everyone, for artists, to public, also us that resilient during this pandemic or can still visible or accessible as long as we are helping to each other. I think uh, this uh, will be um, from my side and I, I hope to have the uh, nice discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Iniksha, for sharing with us your experiences in Indonesia. I'm sure many of us wish we could go back to traveling again and uh, go to Indonesia and explore the wonderful festivals that you have over there. Uh, I think we're beginning to see a similar theme here. You shared some common themes about, you know, collaboration, um, uh, the need to constantly uh, adapt, to respond, and the power to overcome unusual challenges together. I now move on to our third panelist, Paul. Paul is our Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the National Arts Council was the festival director of our Singapore Writers' Festival for several runs, and he's also a published poet. I'm sure he has lots to share with us, so please welcome Paul. Paul, please. Thanks. Thanks, Jome, and uh, thanks to the Culture Academy for inviting us. Uh, I come after two very interesting presentations and speakers, and I think I will echo uh, quite a lot of what they have said uh, I'm going to take us through the um, three festivals. So it's just, it's going to be a whistle stop. And uh, I'm going to share content now and uh, talk a little bit about um, one festival that's over and uh, two others that are upcoming, right? As some of you know, I mean, the Arts Council is uh, 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 an agency that champions and supports the arts. And we commission as well as organize some festivals. So this, these are three of uh, the festivals that, that we're, we're associated with. The first, of course, is the Arts Festival, which has been around, is Singapore's pinnacle uh, festival. It's been around, you know, for four decades. You know, this year was meant to be the 43rd edition. Wow, look at the numbers. Yeah, it's really come a long way. And of course, it's organized by the Arts House Limited. And they are, I, I believe there are some representatives here as well. So I think they can probably speak, speak to uh, what happened this year, you know, even better than me. Uh, 
But I, I'm going to try and offer an overview, you know, with the festival that we commission as well as the festival that, that uh, we uh, uh, organize. So the, the two festivals that we organize are Singapore Writers Festival and Singapore Art Week, which is not really a festival, but uh, uh, I'll explain why in a minute. But it's, it's certainly an important visual arts uh, celebration that we have been doing uh, annually for uh, quite a few years as well. And then I'll just end with some observations. Can In the first place, can you really future-proof? I mean, the assumption here is that you can read the future, right? And you know what the future is going to bring. And of course, as you know, in real life, that doesn't always happen, right? I will start with uh, the arts festival, which if all things had gone well and we didn't have a pandemic, we would have had the 43rd edition of the Singapore International Festival of Arts, which of course, for those of you who follow the arts scene, you know, and who have attended, you know, it has evolved in, in many, many ways. Uh, what happened this year was that, you know, it, the, the timeline between uh, the, 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 the circuit breaker and, and the safety measures and the actual festival was really, really tight. Uh, and uh, the team really didn't have very much time to respond. So what had happened was uh, in March, if you remember, you know, the, the, we were, uh, they had made the announcement that, you know, performances could not carry on. Uh, and so the team only had two months, which is even less than what the Heritage Festival had. So they, they announced in March the decision to actually cancel this year's uh, CIFA. So what had happened was that they then looked at the programming and they tried to think about what could they possibly keep you know, just to have some presence, you know, in, of, of the CIFA brand uh, in the year 2020. But the the official position was that CIFA 2020 uh, was cancelled, right? And uh, all the international acts, they were going to be very an exciting uh, uh, lineup of uh, international performers, as well as collaborations with Singapore arts companies that then eventually uh, all had to be uh, 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 postponed, right? The official, uh, the official line was to take a hiatus, uh, next slide, yeah. You can see that uh, that was the announcement that uh, it had to uh, be to take a hiatus, but they, they were going to go virtual. They were going to take some opportunities to try and uh, uh, keep some presence, you know, so that audiences still know that there was uh, some programming. But what can you do with two months, right? And, and given that you had all these uh, considerations of acts that were coming in, but there was no international travel. So a lot of back-end uh, negotiations and discussions and trying to bring on board uh, 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 the, the whole arts community. If you could not put up a, a show in a theatre or, or in a concert hall, what could you uh, then keep you know, online? You know, what could you realistically uh, put online that was also true to the, art the original artistic intent? And, and made uh, kind of important connections to the audience. Right? So next slide will show you some of the uh, uh, four of the, 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 the Singaporean uh, commissions, which I think all of us were very uh, uh, excited to anticipate, you know, and we were all looking forward to watching these shows, right? There was the necessary stage, the year of no return about environmental degradation. Uh, there was Nine Years Theatre. We had a collaboration with an American company, for Three Sisters. There was Finger Player with Oiwa, the ghost of Yotsuya. And of course, Toy Factory had a long running uh, installation called A Dream of Southern Bow. This was a, a, a three part uh, 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 production. Uh, that was meant to play the third edition this year. So these were just some of the shows that had to take a hiatus. But at the same time, NEC as the commissioner felt that it was important to nonetheless, you know, not just ask people to wait one year, but to keep some kind of uh, activity and some kind of presence uh, online and, and to the general public and possibly even beyond Singapore. So the next slide uh, shows how some of the uh, pivoting happened, right? So for the uh, Toy Factory production, in fact, in interestingly enough, I believe today they're going to launch an animation which is an, uh, that complements the, 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 the three-year productions that uh, Toy Factory has been working on. And the animation is called The Rebirthing of a 400-Year-Old Dream. I haven't seen it, but I believe it's going to be launched later today, the English edition. And then there will be a Mandarin version as well. Interestingly, animation, as I hear from people in the industry, is, an, is, is one kind of growth area in the pandemic because it is uh, a form where you actually can socially distance. Everyone can produce their aspects of their, 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 their animation and it can be assembled in a post-production somewhere and 
it can continue to engage audiences, but it doesn't have all the, 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 the kind of uh, uh, risks that are perhaps associated with a large crowd gathering. So anyway, so this animation will be coming up uh, later today and the Chinese version are coming on as well uh, in the weeks to come. And the, another example would be necessary stage. Again, the production couldn't be staged, but I think what the theatre company has been able to do is to create uh, opportunities for discussions and readings as well. So uh, there were digital uh, uh, interactions and engagements with the year of no return. Uh, and these were some of the, the, the programs that were put online. Next slide. So film is always an important component, uh, but when, when the festival took a hiatus, obviously you couldn't have film screenings during that period. Uh, and uh, you know, at that point, the cinemas hadn't been open yet. So what you could uh, realistically do, and I think what they did was then to have video on demand uh, working with their partners, AFA, the film archives. Uh, so some of the films that they had planned to screen could still then be made available through video on demand. And of course, talks and uh, playlists are just two other examples. I think these are, are fairly uh, uh, what you would expect. Uh, one was a panel that was uh, talking about the future of festivals. And you could, you could do this realistically quite easily, like we're doing now, you know, through uh, Zoom and bring together friends from uh, Singapore as well as overseas. So that still allows you to have that kind of international kind of exchange. And of course, uh, something like a playlist, working with Spotify and working with artists, uh, in this case, uh, Nico, who had been uh, a musician uh, that had uh, featured in last year's SIFA, uh, could then uh, you know, be invited to curate a playlist. And again, that kind of keeps some, some level of presence uh, to the, the CIFA audiences and the broader uh, Singapore public as well. Even though officially the festival took a hiatus, right? Yeah. Next, yeah. Okay, the next festival I'll quickly talk about is the Singapore Writers' Festival, which actually just had a media conference a couple of days ago. And these are just some of the names that are coming, some big names like Art Spiegelman, uh, many fans of anyone, anyone who is a, a fan of graphic novels would, would, know, would know this name, as well as uh, Zadie Smith, for those of you who follow uh, fiction. Uh, excellent top name writers. And, and of course, if you think about it, one kind of advantage of the digital format for the Writers' Festival is that it allows you to bring uh, writers who are not able to travel in the first place, right? So if you have someone who is not willing to travel or not able to travel, then actually, you know, being able to kind of invite the writer to come in uh, by the digital format does in a way create more opportunities. And I do understand from the programming team at SWF that actually there are more big names to come, right? And I think they're able to get these big names partly because uh, the, the writers, some of them who may be, for example, much older or not able to travel, not willing to travel and... Uh, it's also probably more cost effective in some ways to, to, to invite a writer to share uh, digitally. Okay. The next slide suggests some of the uh, ways that the, the festival this year will be pivoting. You see, unlike the CIFA, which didn't really have much time to respond, they had a little bit more time. Of course, the festival hasn't happened yet. It's going to be next uh, in November. So they've been able to try and pivot the entire festival. Okay, for those of you who are not familiar with the Writers' Festival, in normal years, uh, you have a writer talking to uh, an audience. It could be anything from a lecture hall. If it's a big name, it could, be, it could fill up the whole of Victoria Theatre, someone delivering a lecture followed by Q&A, uh, or a panel discussion, perhaps in the Arts House or perhaps in uh, uh, the Drama Centre. You could have uh, uh, different people sit, sitting around and live audience, live participation. So in a way, uh, the digital does allow you to do some of these activities. You can invite writers from uh, all over the world and Singapore to speak, and you can have people uh, participate, uh, which is what the, the, the programming team is doing. But they are not going to go entirely digital. They're going to try a little bit of hybrid programming, and this is on the assumption that come November, we will be able to do small programs, right? Small programs with live audiences. That's the, that's the working assumption. But of course, if the if the measures don't, don't officially relax that way, then, you know, they have to pivot to an entirely digital presentation. But they're working with that assumption, right? Um, I think it's important to have that uh, kind of live uh, interaction. So it's important to have real-time interaction with the authors through the Q&A. Some of the lectures, as I understand, for practical reasons, have to be pre-recorded. So you can pre-record it, 
but I think you still need some element of interactivity. And I think that's always what is the buzz, you know, the, the word that David mentioned, you know, that's the kind of buzz in a festival where people come in and they feel they can bounce off each other, uh, each other's ideas at the moment, you know, and, and they can even get a response from the writer. But you kind of got to balance that with the practical fact that, you know, you don't want a technical glitch. You, like even this presentation that I've tried to do here, right? I had problems on my end, even though the rehearsal went well. The, the reality is that there are technical uh, glitches that will happen. So how do you minimize that? So obviously you got to, again, kind of blend. You got to pre-record some things, but you yet you want to have some live element, the excitement, the frisson of a live thing, right? I mean, come on, if I were doing this pre-recorded, I think it wouldn't be the same, I think, right? Um, so it's about trying to uh, leverage the best you can with the digital format. So it's about new, uh, new kind of ideas, including experimental, you know, uh, ideas with what you can do with the programming. Okay. So what the team has done is to come up with a digital pass, and that's also a first time for 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 uh, the writers' festival team. This digital pass, which you pay for, yeah, you need to pay a certain. Uh, uh, of course, it's a very modest fee. It's really just more for cost recovery more than anything else. Uh, working with our friends from Cystic Life, I believe Joe is in the audience as well, and that's also a kind of a, an experiment for us. We want to be able to see how um, the you can have an interesting, innovative format for different uh, 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 programs happening, right? So you have actually different channels. There are actually options for people with the digital pass to move from one channel to another. Some live uh, and interactive elements, and some of it, as I said, would be like the pre-recorded lectures, right? Um, so that's one innovation, the digital pass that we're working with. But of course, we also maintain a fair amount of uh, free programming. So some 30% of the program would be just be free available for, for, for all public uh, to access. Uh, and this would be the usual either through the website or YouTube or Zoom. And uh, then they're also going to experiment with uh, uh, new formats, uh, other kind of ticketing formats over and above the digital pass, which I, which I spoke about. Right? But of course, there are challenges. And the next slide kind of hints at some of the challenges uh, with uh, doing, uh, uh, going, uh, bringing a literary festival uh, online. Uh, I talked about the, the partnership, the good partnership that the team has with Cystic Life. Uh, we've, of, of course, got to balance, right, these kind of programming vision with the tech risk that I, I spoke about, right? So pre-recording some elements and then the live elements and toggling between the two. And then we also realized that there's actually no one size, right? So in some instances, you may want to uh, use a different kind of digital platform as well, right? Again, I think I've got colleagues from the, the, the team who are here as well, and they, they may be able to answer some of these to, to, to these questions more specifically. And then there's also a lim uh, uh, understanding of the, the limitations of certain platforms. So for example, we're working with Vimeo, where, where, where the, the video will be streamed uh, using this platform, but we also uh, then come up with the reality that Vimeo cannot be accessed in China and Indonesia. So it, in terms of trying to reach, with a, reach out to a, a larger international audience, there will be uh, these considerations as well. Okay, moving on, the third uh, festival, uh, which I will look at would be in the next slide. And that's, of course, the Singapore Art Week, which comes back for its ninth edition. I had earlier qualified by, by saying that this is not, strictly speaking, a festival. Really, it takes, it, unlike the other two, like CIFA and the Writers' Fest, it doesn't have a festival director, right? So it's run by NAC. We we, the visual arts teams essentially aggregates um, a lot of programming. It commissions a few things, but it aggregates a lot of programming from our uh, cultural institutions, from our museums, from our commercial galleries. Selling galleries also take part in this, from the art fairs, uh, from the independent art spaces, uh, from the individual artists themselves, on top of uh, some commission uh, public art projects that NAC uh, might choose to embark on. So it is a real celebration, a huge uh, a kind of get-together of the visual arts uh, community, as well as the, uh, uh, any Singaporean who, uh, who, or tourist uh, who is interested in the visual arts. So it's a big uh, uh, celebration of the visual arts in January. It's always been in January for the last uh, eight years. And this is the ninth year. We're going with 22nd to 30th Jan. Um, some of the things don't change. So if you look at the second line, I, you know, essentially a visual arts expo uh, experience needs to have form and material. So that fortunately, unlike live performances, you know, exhibitions and, and galleries are open even now. So there will be no program, uh, no problem with uh, programming uh, and, and exhibition, right? And being able to uh, see uh, the art in its materi materiality, right? So that, that there's no problem there. Uh, 
what else is also uh, ongoing, of course, would be uh, the idea of uh, knowledge, you know, discourse and thought leadership. And I think whether it's a, it's a digital format or a blended format, those are possibilities that the team continue to work on, have always worked on. And of course, we want to share uh, uh, the artistic legacies of our Singapore artists. So the bottom row basically talks about what, what is core to, 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 to any good visual arts kind of uh, uh, festival and what it will continue to do. Yeah, whether COVID or not, right? But what COVID forces us to do is kind of what the first line is trying to, to, to trying to articulate, which is trying to say that, you know, if you have an exhibition space, then because you may want, you, because there may be restriction in capacities, for example, you might need to reimagine what making an exhibition looks like. Do you need to use uh, uh, not just a physical, the physical space also becomes a virtual space that something is available in the gallery, but is also uh, available virtually. If it's a performance, it, it happens there, but it's recorded, then it's also available uh, virtually. And of course, with visual arts, you always talk about physical spaces. But again, uh, what else can you do with technology that people can experience you know, through their devices while being physically there, uh, while being mindful of the need to keep the uh, uh, social distances, etc. But I think there's an added impetus and I think that's one of the things that the COVID has, 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 has done for all of us. It has kind of forced us to kind of think, what else can we do, you know, to innovate? How else can we use technology? And of course, I mean, AR and VR are not, not new in themselves, but I think that's an example of the kind of impetus that uh, uh, the pandemic has, has uh, pushed us to, 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 to rethink. Uh, and of course, the, the idea of uh, connecting, I think, again, you know, because people are not able to travel, uh, what can we do to try and connect with our, our friends, you know, uh, important uh, artists from abroad, people who have got things to share, who want to engage with Singapore? How do I reach them? Not just from a knowledge point of view, but even from an art-making point of view. Could you make art virtually? Could you, make, could you have two people work on something? And of course, the answer is yes. Of course, you can do that. But I think we all kind of need to apply ourselves to think uh, what can you practically do, you know, to make art that is meaningful and it's something that artists are, are proud to, to want to share with the rest of the world as well. Yeah. And the next slide just quickly uh, sums up uh, some of the, the things to highlight, uh, to look forward to uh, this uh, next January. And of course, this one, the team has had even more time, right? So this is January. So again, interestingly enough, if you think about it, CIFA had the least time, then Heritage Fest, and then Writers Fest. And then Art Week, Art Week has had the more, more, I think the most time. And in a way, that's also necessary because a lot of their, 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 they are thinking of a hybrid model where there will be art actually physically in spaces, in Gilman Barracks, in the Tanjung Paga uh, District Park, in Bras Basar Bugis District, and in the Civic District. So if you want to have art, but you also have to put in those considerations, right, uh, of uh, not wanting uh, uh, crowd density and yet having some kind of uh, uh, physical uh, materiality, you know, uh, when, when, when people are actually moving from uh, precinct to precinct. Uh, there will also be an art fair, the, the C Focus, which has been, uh, this will be the third edition of the C, Fo C Focus, which is a boutique art fair focusing on the uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, again, we probably have to complement this with uh, the virtual art tours, with the guided, guided uh, virtual tours, with the online conversations and talks, which you would expect from any uh, good uh, fair. Uh, then, of course, we have to work with the uh, institution and the independent uh, uh, exhibition spaces and reimagine, you know, beyond the typical kind of white cube gallery space, what does it mean uh, uh, to keep uh, an eye on, on the, the, the form and material of art, but at the same time, you know, think about uh, the digital and the online as well. Okay, so my last slide, which is the next slide, tries to kind of sum up, you know, some observations uh, about future proofing and kind of asking in the first place, can you even really future proof? Can you really predict the tea, read the tea leaves and predict the future, right? And try to synthesize some of what everyone has said. I think all good uh, artistic uh, festivals, you know, have got engagement and have got some things that, some things that just don't change. To me, they are, they are kind of like almost hygiene factors, right? First, topicality, right? So what are the interesting things which you need to talk about? And, I, I, and, and you know, the theme of intimacy, as David very kindly uh, did a shout out for the Writers' Fest team. I mean, it's, it's very relevant today. What does intimacy mean when, when people are, are kept apart, right? When people are not allowed to meet. But, and, and yet, at the same time, there's a certain intimacy in in, in uh, even something like a virtual exchange like this at the same time, right? So topicality, 
what are people talking about? I think that still remains an important uh, 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 feature that undergirds a good festival. The audience experience is important. It's, it's uh, about authenticity, about creating connections, which I think David also spoke about and Ignatia spoke about as well. Uh, and it, in an ideal world, it's not just me, the individual, having a great time and having something to think about after the festival, but actually <laughs> linking up with someone who was also at the festival. So that's the fun part, when you meet someone that, that uh, similarly engaged with the, the artwork and had something interesting to say to you or didn't agree with you or agreed with you and then you had some kind of, kind of more discussion. And I think that is something that you can create online. It may not be exactly the same, you know, the, the, the fact that you can interact with each other and comment on someone's comment, you know, digitally, I think that creates some kind of community as well. I think one second observations and necessity has just forced everybody to be inventive, right? Uh, and I, I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. We have been going on about uh, trying to uh, uh, have more digitalization and, and, and think about how can we persuade ourselves as programmers or the arts groups that we support to think more about digital because like it or not, even pre-pandemic, pre, pre I mean, there were, the, the people were just gravitating to their devices. So how do we make that into uh, a way to, to, to uh, reach out, right? Uh, finding new partners is important. I will close this discussion with a partner that uh, we're happy to work with, which is the Tourism Board. And, and, and we have not commissioned a film, NEC and STB, for a long time. And in a way, the pandemic kind of, again, mother of invention, right? We, we discussed with STB and then we said, okay, you know, let's, let's, let's find something interesting to do. And this opportunity came up and basically it's a destination video that celebrates Singapore, but a very quiet Singapore because of uh, the, the low crowds, but working with our dancers, our ballet dancers from the Singapore Dance Theatre and uh, with the set to the music of uh, SSO. You know, SSO performed this piece, which was pre-recorded. So it all comes together in the brilliant video, which I will close off with in a minute. Uh, but it's kind of finding new partners, kind of saying, okay, who else can NAC work with? So th the same question to all of us here, who else can you work with? Let's just try, right? And sometimes you try, sometimes it will fail, but it's okay. Some things, especially during this period, let's just try. Even if we fail, if we can learn something, we iterate in a better version, a version 2.0, right? And I think that's related to, again, you know, about being resourceful, being resilient and trying to find creative solutions. And also to remind ourselves that, you know, even though we may have a typical audience that we, we normally have, who, who buy our tickets, who come to our shows, who attend our exhibitions, when you go digital, it does mean new audiences at home and abroad. So who are these new audiences for you? And how else uh, uh, can you engage them after the festival, right? How do you, you know, at some point in time when we get to phase three, Sorry, Ignatia, if you don't know what phase three is, we can tell you offline. When we get to phase three and everything is open up, you know, how do you maintain the relationship with these new audiences such that, you know, if, if they, they can become uh, uh, regular uh, supporters, uh, 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 ticket buyers, uh, collectors, you know, and patrons, right? And that le leads us to the final point, which is about long-term, really, it's about long-term sustainability. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, the NEC as a, as, a, as a government agency will continue to support art strongly. But of course, we cannot do it alone, right? So as with all our funding models, as many of you would know, we always part fund because the assumption here is that the audience will step up you know, there is an audience who believes in the art, who wants to support the artist, who believes there's value with it and prepared to put money where their mouth is, right? Uh, and uh, are prepared to be patrons as well, you know? So that's always been the working assumption. But moving ahead, what would that look like? If your capacity is going to be reduced, there will be uh, obvious kind, you've got to redo all the numbers, right? Because your, your ticketing income will be compromised, would be different, right? And also patronage would look different, especially if that's going to tie to, tie to uh, 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 a weak economy, a weak economic outlook for the next couple of years. So your patronage might also be, be uh, uh, different, right? Uh, might actually decrease, right? So that's, that's some of the reality staring at all of us. Uh, and hope, hopefully that, uh, that you know, when, when things rebound, it will rebound uh, strongly, that we can come out stronger from all of this. But those are very real issues. I think for, for any arts company, anyone that's putting out, any festival that's putting out 
uh, uh, programming, you kind of need to think about how uh, how to balance the books essentially. And uh, that's something I think we're all grappling with. Uh, we're hoping to support as much as we can, but it is also imperative that the corporate partners, the, the audiences who are out there continue, and the patrons who are out there continue to, to, to show their support uh, for the arts and culture sector. Yeah. And on a happier note, I, I will end on the video that I promised you, which hopefully will then lead us nicely to the Q&A and Dr. Cho Ming. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Paul, for sharing us with us your very beautiful video and also the very heartwarming message of collaboration behind it. It was a promotional video. I hope the audience is excited about it as well. And our friends from overseas in Asia uh, will feel that you want to come and visit when we can. We hope we can do that soon. Thank you, Paul, for also leaving us your very positive message of let's just try. It's like Nike's message, right? Just do it. Mm, mm. I think it's, it's really wonderful to hear from all your individual experiences, you know, how challenges inspire innovation. Um, I'm, I'm sure all of you were trust in a situation where you all had to adapt and innovate very, very quickly and creatively. I think, uh, David, you said three months. Paul, two months. Inesha, I'm not sure how much time you had to turn your festival around. So perhaps to kickstart the discussion, I'd like to invite each one of you to share with us one pressing challenge that you all had to uh, deal with during these uh, times and also one positive outcome that was born out of this very unique opportunity that maybe you wouldn't have done otherwise, you know, to either present work or engage the audience in a very different way um, uh, and, and ended up with very surprising and, and positive outcomes. David, would you like to start? Sure. Um, yeah, I think for Heritage Fest, you know, theatre performances have always been part of uh, festival offerings. And it's uh, usually very immersive. It's a creative interpretation of history and heritage. Um, so when, you know, of course, the, the, the COVID situation happened, we couldn't have these live performances 
So I think one that I mentioned in the presentation was really uh, Kate Theatre's um, stage work, which then very quickly got converted into an online computer game, uh, which uh, we actually found was, was, I think, quite popular with a younger crowd. The whole gamification, you know, of, of heritage, uh, but also the whole choose your own adventure. And I think and this is definitely a form of engagement that uh, I would say six months, three months ago, you wouldn't have considered something like that. You know, and that I think has opened um, a lot of possibilities for us. So, for example, like, yeah, for Heritage Fest this year, we are looking a bit more at computer games, for example. Um, I think another one would be the Agukwe, the, the open business um, series that we have um, done, which is a workshop theatre piece also with uh, the uh, traditional business practitioners. Um, you know, and, and something like that. It's, of course, on site. It would have been a very immersive, very intimate experience, um, something for, let's say, 20 people at a time. Um, but because of the pandemic, of course, you couldn't allow that to happen in very tight spaces. But, you know, the, the, the video documentary that was then done has something like almost 10,000 people viewing it. We would never have reached that, that you know, that kind of numbers and people... Uh, numbers of people viewing it and also people viewing it like, kind of on demand, right? As and when it's convenient for you, people over based overseas can also view it. So I think for us, that's really, you know, changed the way that we uh, have looked at such, well, physic last time we would have done this only in the physical realm, such programming. Uh, so I think, for example, as we're planning for next year, we think it is important to have both. We probably still have a physical experience for people who do want to sign up. It's really, there's really a technical quality that you cannot uh, you know, replicate. But, you know, no matter what, we will still have a sort of video uh, documentary sort of version component um, as well for people who may not want to go down to reach a larger audience, but to also sp spread the word for the, the you know, whoever is the sort of the, the focus mm. the other piece of the documentary. I think it really helps. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, David. I, I didn't get to play the game, but uh, I saw the Uncle Bay video. <laughs> and uh, I suppose it's, it's, it's nice in a way because when you view some of these things at home, it almost brings the experience to your homes, right? And that in itself is quite an intimate experience. I think we're also hoping to, how do we, further that, right? So we've already been thinking how like, this year was kind of a pilot next year, how do we further that? So how do we continue that, that intimacy, that experience? Yeah. So there are some ways, I think some ideas we can try next year, for example, just simply we watch this Uncle video, then can you buy and eat some, right? Because that really kind of seals the experience and the, <laughs> the, it really, you know, you, your memories of it years later, like, oh, I remember doing this, it was virtual, but then I had the, the real thing after that. So things like that can really help. Yeah. Ignatia, would you like to share with us your experience? Yes, sure. Um, of course, during this time, like the big challenge is also about the numbers and also the positive outcomes is about the numbers. So numbers, it's, it's affecting um, the, the good outcome or the positive outcome. And also it's, it's become also our challenge because um in Yogyakarta it's we have a we have a very very special situation which all this infrastructure has has to build our, our, ourselves means that uh, it's very very community based and it's very very basic based in the or rooted in the community um and 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 we this infrastructure is 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 based on this art event, which uh, it's also our art month, and it's normally happening during uh, our festival, uh, uh, during our job. And since the situation, then everything has to be shifted. Uh, it's not only our job, but I think the rest of the festival has to uh, rework um, their schedule and their plan. Um, and this actually becoming also um, the big infrastructure, not only for the arts, but also for the creative economics and also the tourism itself. So it's become very, very broad um, um, horizon, actually. But, um, but we, we have to rework this uh, with creating the new space, as maybe Paul and also David is mentioning, that uh, this is 
about not to have the new uh, new audience only, but how we we can um, do the creative uh, hybrid version of both like the, the new and also who is our uh, actual audiences. So um, I think this is becoming the positive outcome then all this moment to see exhibition become a very pristine, very intimate, um, a very explosive and very reflective moment uh, for audience to come because normally it's all about crowds and the number yeah. it's become only the numbers and now numbers is become a very very uh, meaningful i think number very meaningful points so it's about quality and and i think uh, that's uh, makes everything become very valuable to see the um, quality of the artist and the meaning and uh, and the idea and and that's um, something that I think most of us has missed uh, for a long time. Thank you, Inisha. I think um, during this period, all of us has become a lot more appreciative of many things that we take for granted. Huh? Paul? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <I> agree <laughs> with you. Yeah, <laughs> many things we, we we take for granted, which I think we 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 appreciate much more. Yeah, uh, I I would just maybe just share a, a quick. Quick, quick kind of story, uh, not directly related to festival, but basically the, the, the work that we do at the Arts Council. I mean, and, and it's related to events, so it's still got a connection to today's discussion. You know, one of the things that we, we that 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 we do is to kind of honor the, the the patrons and the artists. So there are certain events that we do. For example, like the, there's a usual gala event. Uh, those of you in the arts uh, companies, you all know something called the Patron of the Arts, where we have a nice sit-down dinner in a nice hotel and we thank them for supporting uh, the arts companies. So this is NEC's way of recognizing people who give to the arts. They're not giving to NEC, but they're giving to the arts company and supporting the general arts ecosystem, which is a great thing. But how do you do that in a pandemic, right? How do you do... You, we're not allowed to have uh, a kind of sit-down dinner. I mean, well, we could maybe have under current uh, rules, we can have five people, right? <laughs> that doesn't quite make for a gala <laughs> dinner. Um, so that's a very real challenge, right? So uh, the response, uh, well, maybe a bit predictably, of course, is that we pivoted uh, uh, digitally. And I think we, at least for this year, we may not be able to do this year after year after year. The effect would be lost. But I think there was a certain novelty in pivoting uh, what was a gala sit-down event into a digital event. And the important thing, the most important thing is that the, 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 the stakeholders, in this case, the patrons, were actually quite happy with it. It was a very succinct program, uh, 40, less than 45 minutes, everything in. Uh, and uh, we were able to make them feel that they were honoured we actually delivered gifts to all the patrons individually. So wow. everyone had a box of uh, chocolates and uh, uh, champagne or non-alcoholic wine, depending, right? Uh, delivered to their homes to, to honour uh, the, 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 the patrons, right? So I think those kind of small gestures helped uh, and a certain level of intimacy. And the program, of course, mm. was, was kind of premiered at a certain time. So everyone came together. So there was a certain community, which I think we spoke about, and then people commenting online. So I think uh, that kind of still created the same kind of buzz, right? And uh, just to share another slightly interesting anecdote, we were scrambling to insert uh, a speech by the minister because at that point, the minister was uh, less than uh, a week in the portfolio. I think a week or maybe two weeks in the portfolio. So yeah, okay, we need, to, we, we need to have the minister because I think it's important. No, but I mean, from a strategic point of view, you want to kind of accord the kind of status, right? Because these are your top patrons and your top corporates, both individual and corporates. And I think uh, signature-wise, it is right that we, we, we really kind of bend over backwards, scramble to try and get uh, a recording, you know, uh, of uh, 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 Minister uh, Tong, uh, at the at a, at a very last minute, but I think it went very well, and I think everybody, uh, uh, the patrons were 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 happy. Yeah, and they were actually pleasantly surprised that that minister actually spoke. Yeah. Hmm. Thanks, Paul, for for sharing with us how you kind of honor your patrons and uh, your your special guests. I think on the other end of the spectrum, we've got uh, some questions here about how we can reach out to maybe the more underprivileged. I mean, many of you have shared, you know, how the medium that we've become more accustomed to has expanded our outreach and make uh, festivals and programming much more accessible. 
so do we see this as being an opportunity to become more inclusive? In a way, I guess, do we see an opportunity for us to bring some of our content to people, especially to people who you know, do not normally have um, ready access to some of these uh, uh, content if they're not able to come to the festivals? Would anyone like to share first? Mm, I can, uh, Chomi, I can share a bit on this. I mean, we, I don't think we have an answer to this, but uh, it certainly was, I think, a very conscious decision for us uh, or something at least consciously very conscious about this year as we went completely digital because uh, I think we're very conscious that not everyone has Wi-Fi, for example. Not mm. everyone has access to laptops. Uh, as you saw, you know, from home-based learning, right? It's, it's just that it happened mm. with a lot of students. Um, and I think, you know, so this is something that we, because previously when the festival was done in the sort of physical realm, uh, most things were free and we want to keep it that way and that, that accessibility there. Um, I, I think that um, going digital actually creates sometimes for some communities a bit more um, barriers to entry. Uh, mm. So we're quite conscious of this and I would say like next year we are going to try and I think physical, as, as Paul has mentioned, some physical activities will probably be possible. Um, and so we are creating our programs and, you know, to, to specifically reach out to certain underserved communities that we think may not uh, you know, have, have digital access, for example, to the festival. So I think that's very important as we all talk about going digital, going online. Uh, but there are certain sort of communities also who may not uh, be connected that way. I'll just make a broad point that it's actually quite, even the, the, the name, uh, the term underserved, right, is so broad, right? So I, 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 I first would say that we, let's, we can try and break it down. I mean, if someone is visually impaired, right, then actually the, 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 the whole modality would be different, right? Because it would be about listening. It's about what kind of music can you put up, right? Um, and then if, you're, if, you're, if you have uh, challenges with mobility, then uh, that's where, in a way, you know, having the device is actually a good thing. But I think the point that David made about, about people having access to devices, of course, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a real one. Uh, but I would also add that actually Singapore is one of the highest uh, uh, mm -hmm. device uh, ownership uh, in, in the broadly, la, broadly. So, so like we just finished our run of the uh, Silver Arts Festival, which is uh, a festival uh, kind of uh, which which targets the the silver demographic, right? And we still find that there is quite great traction. I mean that people are. Uh, I mean, the numbers, I mean, from a numbers point of view, although it's all be beyond numbers, of course, but from the numbers point of view, I mean, it just seems that there are plenty of people looking at the content, engaging with the content, commenting on the content. Mm -hmm. But there are some interesting insights, which again, I think my team can speak better to. I mean, one of the, the things that I found, uh, which I found quite interesting was that uh, the, 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 the platform that you serve the, the content on should be something familiar. So YouTube is now very familiar. So you want to go with YouTube as opposed to, well, I don't know, you know, uh, some of the other less uh, popular uh, platforms with the seniors, right? Mm -hmm. But YouTube is is got great uh, uh, traction and, 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 and the senior demographic have no, no problems navigating that. So it's really about customizing uh, the, the modality for the who in the underserved that you are, you are, you are looking at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I think I'm really agree with, with Paul because um, to in, with engaging the content to underline that since I think um, now it's, it's not only about how arts can be merged with technology or innovation, but also to see like who is our audiences and how they can access this. Because um, also yeah, technology is, is, is moving very fast and everyone is, is very attracted to it. Um, they are very happy actually to it. But uh, I think for us, um, there is a very, uh, there is a big distinction between uh, which medium and which content can be fit uh, with certain way. Um, and also audiences actually has a lot of limitation. And um, even though we, we have to deal with like little thing like now, because since everything is has um, people, people has to do with online, like they have to buy the tickets online. It's still, it's still a problem for us. Um, as some places has still this issue. It's not only about to access the content, but to also access the regulation. So there is actually still uh, a lot of, I think, adaptation 
to the the new way, or or I think this is will be the new cultures, if we say, we say, because there's I think there's a lot of time, and um, we have to uh, reorganize a different different medium with different media to to recommunicate. I think. Yeah, I think many of you talked about blended festivals as well. I think um, with some relaxation in some of our current guidelines, I think that uh, certainly opens up a lot of new opportunities. I think there's a lot of discussion about you know the future now that we have experimented and tried many new forms. Perhaps you know some of the great things that we've learned and the opportunities that have opened up will allow us to really think of. Um, even more exciting ways to create uh, content and present programs through a blended medium. Uh, we have a most popular question here. Uh, perhaps a panel would like to share some thoughts on blended festivals. How best to balance both real-time interactions and pre-recorded content uh, to make the best of it so that it's not just a YouTube playlist? Uh, panelists like to share your thoughts on this I think Paul I think you mentioned a little bit about you know how we can still create intimacy through some of the um, chat rooms and you know in, in a way you are also bringing people from all over the world together and I suppose sometimes if we create a more, more smaller platforms we, we could also have more intimate uh, conversations I guess and it's how to marry that uh, with um, intimacy and expanding your audience at the same time, right? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's not, there's no, probably no correct answer for, to, to this question uh, from JC. Uh, I, I would say that if it's a programming uh, uh, decision, then you kind of need, you really do need to look at the technological risks, right? And if you have someone on the other side who is giving, I mean, this is a real case, right? So this is an SWF uh, Writers' Fest consideration. If you have someone who is 80 plus years old, a very eminent writer, but who may or may not get good tech support where he or she is, right? Uh, but you're probably safer trying to make sure, to, to be absolutely sure and, and that you have something pre-recorded so that you have something that's already anchoring the event. And then the, 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 the frisson of the, 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 the live interaction has to come from the Q&A, right? So after the lecture, over the, you toggle over to a live space where there's a, there's a host and the host is live, right? Uh, and the host then introduces uh, the, the writer, right? So if you imagine this version playing out in other platforms, you, then you, you try and get the best of both worlds uh, and, you, and you reduce the risk. Then I would also say that if you're doing a workshop, and I've attended these before, right? You can have work. So imagine if this was a gigantic conference and we wanted to have uh, uh, breakout sessions. The technology does allow for it. And I've been able to get fairly good group discussion. So imagine even in this format, we then all break out into different rooms, room A to Z, right? And there are different themes in each room. And maybe after that, you had to present something or even create art, depending on what, again, you're, you're, you're gathering for, right? Technology does allow you to do that, right? And I would encourage us to explore these uh, further. Of course, again, you've got to work out the technology and sometimes it can be a bit glitchy <laughs> depending on people's Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi becomes quite critical. Then there's the, the, the inequality business of people having, some people having more access will, will crop up, right? Especially if you have international uh, participants as well. But again, I think it's something worth trying. Yeah, because, you know, I think it, this modality of operating is going to be around for a while. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, uh, Chome, I would just echo what uh, Paul said. I think midway through the Heritage Festival this year, uh, exactly, Paul, what you've described, you know, when you have a pre-recorded and then you have a live dialogue Q&A, um, that was kind of the sweet spot that we found uh, to really work for us because the pre-recorded allowed for more control, I suppose, of, you know, setting the nerves, you know, of a lot of our, <laughs> uh, yeah, like, yeah. Heritage, uh, you know, like members who involve the partners, and a lot of them are, you know, they're they're very good at, you know, like making egg tarts, but they're not very good at, you know, being confident on camera. But uh, you know, it, I think that sweet spot really of having that live Q and A uh, mm. portion as well really added that excitement and buzz as well to that pre-recorded set. But it is the best of both worlds, and uh, I think it's definitely something that we will be advocating a lot of future editions. 
I think with us, um, we also would like to still have this lifeless, lifeless sensation uh, because um, I think some of the people are still uh, imagine that they are entering like spaces which there's a lot of people and there is some something happening and going on. So then um, we do this blended blended um, works um, to the platform and all the programs. But because we, we have a diverse, diverse program going on, so we have to look like how we implement each program, which one it's it fits with this lightness situation, and which one is fits with this pre-recorded. Because of course I'm agree with Paul when you do like big uh, talk session, then sometimes it's 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 nice if if you you do it pre-recorded. Because then uh, everything will be settled down, and 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 they can follow with the very stable networks. Because now networks, it's, it's also the big thing. And um, but also uh, lightness can be still uh, allows us to look like how people can respond, and they can enter, and they can contribute like in the in the time in the time frame. And I think some people still still like it. And for us, it's also something and some enjoyment that we, we want to keep it still yeah still has in the festival yeah yeah i think during this period i think um when many of us you know especially during you know in singapore during our circuit breaker period when many of us um, had a lot more time at home we certainly appreciated you know a lot of content made available and accessible online to, to those of us who have access to it because it's, uh, you know, some of this is, they really add, you know, joy and delight, you know, uh, to, to, you know, a more routine day to day. But uh, as we become more accustomed to these new ways of working online, I think many of us are also getting Zoom fatigue, Microsoft team fatigue, Right, and uh, I hear people telling us that okay, when they have free time, they don't want to spend their their, their time online anymore. Uh, do you have some challenge, or how do you think we can navigate our way? You know, as uh, in this, you know, uh, very competitive online space now with a lot of program competing for attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's a very funny because uh, what we do before we, we do this kind of um, publication, joint publication. Uh, it's called Jogja Art Weeks, which everyone posted their schedule like day to day or weekly or monthly, and there's hundreds of things going on. And and now everyone is turned online, and sometimes uh, we have like hundreds of of programs uh, happening in the same hours, like 7 p.m. or uh, 6 p.m. There will be like hundreds of events uh, coming together, and um, uh, I think this publication is very helpful since everyone has to communicate like which program goes in which hour and which dates, so we can navigate um, uh, the attention of the public. Also, the publication can go uh, well, so people can schedule which they join or which exhibition they visit and, and which concert they, they can uh, visit and <laughs> see. And I think this is uh, one of uh, yeah things that's still uh, visible to us in, in Jogja and the city uh, to be, yeah, we, we work on it together, yeah, online <laughs> still in the website, yeah, through website. Oh, that's nice. So you're saying that there is a kind of a common platform where all the different events are listed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a website. Yeah, I'm sure it's very really useful. Yeah. Mm. Paul, any thoughts as you are curating, you know, your Writers Fest and uh, all that, you know, how, how are we fighting for the eyeballs? Um, I suppose I, you I have your big names, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a reality for, for the cultural calendar. The cultural calendar is, uh, you know, jam-packed with many activities. Yes, that's right. I think at the stat board level, right, between NAC and NHB uh, and uh, the, the uh, large uh, cultural institutions like Esplanade, 
uh, and uh, National Gallery, there actually is a fair amount of information sharing already, right? So there's already, for example, just one platform where we try and pull all the big events together to try and coordinate, which is to the question that I think there was a question that popped up in the Q&A, right? Uh, we to, to try mm. and coordinate. So you kind of know when Heritage Festival is and you kind of know where Singapore Art Week is and you know when CIFA is and everyone kind of knows where everyone is. So that's at the the large festival level. And I think it's useful to have uh, that coordination. Uh, and uh, uh, some of you may be aware that that coordination is useful because for another agency like the Singapore Tourism Board, if they want to communicate to an international audience about the, the, the kind of cultural activities in, in Singapore, you know, and the, des the destination that they have to come and visit, then that, that, that kind of top level calendaring I, I just made a verb out of a noun. Uh, not sure it's proper <laughs> English. Uh, but that kind of calendaring actually helps uh, the, 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 our friends in the tourism agency do their marketing, right? So I think at the top line, it's good. But I want to acknowledge that, you know, there, there are a lot of arts activities that are not programmed by, by NAC or by NHB or by, by the cultural institutions. And they're programmed by the arts groups out there. And we have a very broad, diverse, uh, vibrant art scene. Um, so there, there is a fair amount of uh, 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 people kind of having to coordinate. Well, the good thing is that the big festivals, everyone, uh, th that's already locked in. So if you are offering another program, either you maybe complement the existing festivals or you work around the time zones or, or, or who do you think your, your, your target audiences are. It's not an exact science, but I think this has been what has been going on uh, for the last couple of years. And also from a practical point of view, uh, as some of you may know, you know, uh, for those of you who run venues or have venues, people do book venues in advance. So already you kind of know if someone's going to plan something, they have soft booked the space uh, and that, 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 and then you can, you know, you, you basically go with what, what spaces are available as well. So that's another parameter that people have to practically uh, work within. Yeah. I suppose it's a happy problem to have that we are, you know, uh, have access to such a broad range of uh, programs and uh, events. We have a couple of questions okay. here uh, related to funding and resourcing. Because uh, with some festivals, it is also a way of uh, generating ticket skills, sales to cover some of the costs to run events. Um, how does that work with uh, you know, some of our virtual programs? There was also a question about, you know, uh, relating to, I think, David's uh, thought he shared with us about decentralizing events. Um, would, would that come with also additional manpower and resource uh, requirements? So, yeah, I think this is uh, quite a pertinent question for, for festival organizers. So I think welcome your comments and thoughts. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we haven't, we've been thinking a lot about this, but we haven't done it in real life, of course, yet. But um, I think my suspicion is that it may be a similar resource utilization. I don't think it would be that much more if you can rely on technology a bit more and let technology facilitate that process. Um, I think this, this is kind of our experience from this year, at least, you know, relying a lot on technology and uh, video production as well. I think given the reach and also what you can do uh, with technology, it, uh, it may balance itself out. So it may in the future possibly be a replacement or I don't think it will add too much more because I think technology, if we've, we found also technology has come you know, a long way very quickly and the cost of te applying technology to, for example, customization, um, there are quite a number of tools and platforms and, and things you can do already that's available out there. So I think it's more having awareness that these what's available out there uh, and trying to find the most cost-effective solution. I think it's uh, not really good. Mm. I think for funding, uh, the funding model moving ahead, I think it will be something that is evolving. I, I, I don't think anyone has, has clarity completely, right? Because we're, we're still kind of figuring out, for example, uh, using the Cystic Live format, what, what could you realistically cost recover? I mean, that's a very practical issue. I mean, the digital pass that I spoke about, you know, uh, what would the kind of traction be among uh, a, a literary festival goer? 
even though it's priced very modestly, you know, it's uh, fifteen twenty dollars in that in the ballpark range. In and it's over the the digital pass is over uh, ten days, right? Uh, but even then, you know, uh, what 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 are the, what would the take up rate be? So I I would like to think that we're we're in the stage where we're still trying to get the kind of necessary data to form a, a clearer opinion. But the direction has to be that if you're going to have more digital, then uh, given you know the current uh, 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 reality that we're where we're in, then what could you kind of cost recover within that 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 digital parameter? So I think that question is very real. Um, I, I would just add on another layer that even fundraising has gone digital. As some of you all would know, there's a there's a website called Giving.sg which aggregates uh, a lot of the uh, uh, fundraising campaigns uh, in the social sector, in the charity sector, and a lot of our arts groups have been going online. Uh, and NAC, of course, has been trying to aggregate them and trying to get general patrons to go and visit Giving.sg and, and contribute to the different uh, uh, mm. arts and uh, culture charitable causes. I, I think that kind of uh, uh, modality, I think that that is, that's going to be here for a while. And I, of course, I'm happy to see that many of our, our arts companies have become uh, very savvy with uh, fundraising online. Uh, and even looking at very micro kind of campaigns because, I mean, give to X company is a typical message, but give to X company who is doing this initiative for the next three weeks, specially targeting whatever, you know, uh, supporting a particular production or supporting even migrant workers uh, in, and, and literature. There was one, there was one uh, uh, giving, dot, mm. uh, uh, giving SG campaign uh, to support uh, giving books to uh, 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 the migrant right, uh, workers in our midst. So that kind of adaptability and the use of online, I think would help with the kind of uh, 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 the sustainability in the longer run for festivals as well. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. There is a related question, you know, whether, you know, some of the online content, even if we make it uh, freely accessible, it's a good way to attract new audiences and perhaps, you know, uh, attract them to turn up when physical programming can resume in future. Right. I, I think, I mean, that kind of free digital content is always relevant, you know, for, for brand building. But I think anyone running an arts company will say that it's probably not sustainable in the long run. I mean, that's one mm -hmm. of the realities, right? I mean, on, a, on an ongoing basis, year on year, could you afford to just put, keep on putting on free content? Uh, how does that work out, right? Uh, it would mean that you either have a patron or the government back you up 100%, right? Uh, so I, I think as a tool to build awareness, to make sure that your content people get a flavor of what you, you represent. I think that's very relevant. Uh, or mm -hmm. if you are, you're, you're, you're pivoting towards uh, content that is al always meant to be free. Like, for example, you know, NEC has a program called Arts in Your Neighborhood, right? Which it's meant to serve the broad community, right? But that is fully funded by NEC, right? And, and the thinking behind that is that you're trying to reach people who may not have the propensity or, or, or exposure to the arts, and therefore, you want to kind of build appreciation. So you think quite deeply and you say, okay, I will put in some uh, resourcing here and this will be free. But for most of, the, for most of us, the, 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 the idea of uh, trying to get uh, ticketing income or patronage, uh, well, certainly ticketing income, sorry, not patronage, ticketing income uh, does, does uh, uh, come into play. Lah. And I would actually encourage us to to kind of ask ourselves what exactly are we trying to do in the first place? Yeah. And then that will inform uh, the kind of uh, 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 potential kind of revenue streams. Yeah. Could I just make an observation for and a response to one of the questions about how you track reach and participation? Yeah. Is that yeah, all right? Please go ahead, Paul. Show me. Yeah. yeah, of course. Um, yes, please. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think the, the tracking, because we're going to pivot so much uh, digitally and online, I think it's, it's important to, to kind of, yeah, at least kind of know what, what you're trying to do and how you track your, your own kind of outcomes like, so that you can tell yourself you think you achieve your, your personal goals, right? Uh, at, of course, at a very fundamental level is the usual kind of uh, views that you serve uh, and the, the unique uh, users that you reach out to. I would caveat that that is useful, but you know, if you had marketing dollars and you pump in uh, the online marketing, actually that will go up, the views will go up, right? So I would kind of 
caveat that 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 it is useful to use that as a as a way to track uh, um, the traction of your programming. But what what is also quite useful and is another dimension is uh, engagement. So people who are willing to share your content because share is actually quite a high level of commitment. It means you're prepared to to take uh, to have skin in the game to tell my friends that this content is very good. I want them to see it. So sharing. Certainly, commenting is also quite engaged. It means that this moved me or provoked me enough to want to leave a comment and then maybe start a, a, a whole thread, right? Because there's a comment to my comment and then there's, there's a comment to that, etc., etc. So then you create that kind of buzz and community that, that potentially we, we, we spoke about. Um, I, I would encourage us to try and create that kind of content which creates a, a small community, even if it's just for that moment. Uh, uh, through uh, uh, that kind of participation, yeah, as opposed to just the eyeballs. And also just a reminder that actually, you know, uh, one of the feedback we've heard from the, the uh, musicians, right, is that you have to kind of get millions and millions of uh, plays before you actually see any kind of uh, good money because it's actually quite hard to monetize YouTube and Spotify mm -hmm. unless, well, unless you're BTS, Right, I mean, if you're BTS, then you know, then it, all bets are off, right? You you can make tons of money. By the way, those of you who haven't figured out, you go and Google BTS an online concert. So it is possible to make money from a live stream. I can't. It's like twenty million dollars or something like that from a live stream concert. But that's BTS. But then it does suggest that at some level, people are willing to pay for content that they like. Right. That it must mean that it must mean that. Of course, I know this is probably an outlier. But it's just something to think about. Yeah. Mm. I think we've actually addressed many of the questions that have come in. Uh, but, you know, the topic really is about the future of festivals. I thought maybe we could also get panelists to comment a little bit on some of the thoughts uh, David shared with us earlier on about, you know, whether about the idea of moving festivals from the macro to the micro creating more personalized, you know, bespoke experiences that are more flexible and uh, customizable. Yeah. A any thoughts on that? I thought that was a very interesting thought. Mm -hmm. So, um, Chloe, taking up on uh, this, I think, Paul, interestingly, you mentioned the BTS concert, uh, which, uh, if I'm not wrong, if I, if I have the correct one in mind, it's one that you can actually sign up and you can be the only person in the concert and they can sing for you, to you. So it's a customized experience, uh, if I'm not wrong. That's why it did so well. It's kind of like you, you replicate the live, you know, kind of concert feeling, but really like, you could never do this in the physical world, of course, right? Have a concert where right, 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 unless you put some money, you know, for them to sing to you only. Um, but this was sort of done digitally and that's why I think it was very, very popular. So I think there is, uh, we are seeing uh, a sort of, I mean, people are searching for unique and, and sort of very unique and authentic experiences. And uh, I think the customized sort of experience is, is one way to address this. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, David, to, to clarify what I found, I mean, I have uh, uh, checked online, right? Is that yeah. it was a hundred minute online concert. Maybe, maybe there are two different things that they did. Yeah, there okay. was an online concert with 750,000 paid viewers and it earned... Singapore $25 million. Yeah. Uh, it was an online live stream concert. Yeah. But I wouldn't put it past mm -hmm. them to do what you just described because it sounds like also an <laughs> interesting yeah, the, uh, alternate yeah. revenue stream. It may as be well. a different yeah. thing. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I saw yeah. a, a, a sort of image of this. So uh, it was very, it's like a, almost like a VR, AR kind of view, but then your place, you, your avatar is placed in this one you know concert hall like very small okay space and then they're just interesting very yeah yeah but also I, think, Paul, yeah. I wanted to say just now what you mentioned you know about like how artists are also not earning enough on spotify and all this but also how going online is really to me just it is marketing i completely agree because i think there is value in, in the physical life experience um and really i think the online can only really sells that marketing value and power but to drive people to excite people about the physical and hopefully that will translate to then the, also back to the revenue and the funding mm. 
Yeah. Then I'm just Asia, wondering whether there are yeah. any uh, BTS fans out there who want to speak. Are they allowed to speak? Are people from the audiences allowed to <laughs> raise their voice and 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 I don't know, pledge their allegiance to BTS and how great the concert was? <laughs> no, are they allowed to speak? <laughs> No, they can't. Uh, okay. Yeah, they just just uh, MCC. I just answered. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, the answer is no. You can you can chat your chat and put your comments online and say how much you love them. I think that you can do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wanted to ask Ignatia because you know uh, Art Jock is such a it's such a you know festival that happens in the city, right? Uh, is is there some thought about you know the future of festivals? Would you rethink the scale or you know any thoughts of uh, you know how how would you respond to David's uh, thought about the idea of perhaps having smaller scale, decentralized, more micro festivals? Yeah, um, I'm I'm very uh, I'm very thrilled with the uh, with how David um, uh, addressing this idea about decentralization because it's very fits with how we are um, presenting our program and festival today. Like the internet itself has this kind of concept of decentralizing, and um, actually to say that's the micro program can be a, a very critical point to to look. Because um, of course, festival it's about scale, which people look at. There's a big mass, and and people are going, and there's a, a loudness there. And how festival have to now we have to resemble everything into something, um, yeah, very intimate. If 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 I can use this this term, um, I have I have a very very uh, I think very significant experience with. This is not happening in Jogja, but but I went I went to look um, to another festival happening in in Europe, uh, which is very different situation, of course. But but this um, this ha- was happening two years ago in Germany, which was to do a hackathon. So hackathon is actually a very technological um, term, which um, a lot of makers um, and then pro- uh, developer programmers. Uh, and, and they sit together with the cultural practitioner like uh, curators, artists, and they're sharing ideas and recreating a platform like gamification of, of artworks or making uh, some platform for a concert or music or composition or different um, creating a different experience to looking on a museum and so on and so on. And then after they're pitching the idea, they can meet the stakeholders. And I look, this can can be very a significant way of of a country uh, maybe like us, which this kind of infrastructure are still missing a lot. Means that um, most of the events are still happening such in a very um, independent way, which is uh, uninstitutionalized. So um, we think. Um, this kind of platform, like a hackathon, could be a way for us to also navigate uh, some program which we can still invite people to collaborate. So um, how we can shift those interaction which normally happening in the physical space can also still going on um, in the virtual space, I think. Yeah, thank you. Paul, there was a, a, a question from Li Chung. Uh, I'm not sure if you would like to address it. Okay. Uh, let me have a look at that. Yeah. Okay. About oh, so spaces. Well, well. I mean, we've, th- there's been quite a lot of uh, discussion on this, and I think NAC has has uh, uh, spoken about this as well publicly, right? That we want to support, uh, 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 of course, the arts groups in their, in, in their art making, and that's why we 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 the major companies are funded the way they're funded, and and uh, that's something that we will continue to do. Uh, but there are certain kind of broader policies about land use, right? Uh, that. Unfortunately, we are governed by. Uh, but Lily, I think this conversation perhaps is a separate conversation. It's not so much about future-proofing festivals, but I'm happy to have a, a separate conversation with you 
uh, to kind of uh, explicate, I mean, what, what the thinking is and how we are trying our best to, to, to uh, support the arts companies. And, and we have been doing it for, for decades, right? Uh, but like I said, we are governed by certain other policies. Uh, we are trying to unlock, maybe I use this opportunity to share that, you know, whether it's about a festival or just the art scene in general, right? Um, spaces are always an important consideration. So festivals need to take part, take place in spaces. And it's good that the spaces are a diversity of spaces and not just, uh, uh, you know, the space behind me, you know, Goodman Art Centre, you know, and the Greenfield there. Of course, we can program within NAC spaces or within government spaces. But I think it's also good that corporates and people who have spaces can unlock those spaces, right? So if it, it could be a private space or if it could be a kind of a collaboration with a commercial partner. As you know, for example, companies like Singapore Dance Theatre and uh, uh, Wild Rice have worked with Capital Land. So but when you have corporates who are willing to come on board, right, to help kind of, because they believe in the arts. So back to that point, they, they, they believe, they see value, you know, they want to champion the arts. And if you have those kind of like-minded partners, then, you know, the sum total of what we can do grows, because at the end of the day, you know, at least the resources that, that NEC as one agency has would be, would be finite. And if you have corporates who are willing to step up, you know, to say, I want to, I, I see value in your work as well. Let's work together. I offer you, you know, uh, something. I think that would be excellent. And then directionally, that's something that we're, we're trying to work towards. Lah. Yeah. I also wanted to just quickly respond to Carmeni's uh, point, which I think is, uh, is very real, right? Because, you know, screen fatigue and... Uh, at the same time, we are trying to pivot, tell everybody, you know, digital is the, the, the thing to do because the pandemic situation will be like that for a while. And I think that is, it is an irony. It is something, a balance that we're trying to strike, you know. I mean, even on a personal level, I, I mean, after staring at the screen the whole day, and then at eight o'clock, I'm supposed to go and relax with another arts offering on screen, right? There's some irony there, right? Yeah. But uh, I, guess, uh, I, I guess we all have to rely on the resilience of each of us and that we all have a common purpose and that we all know what we're... We all believe that there's, there's a value in what we're, try, what we're all doing, you know, whether you are an art maker or an intermediary or like us uh, uh, and someone in the administration or the government agency, that we, we will do what it takes, you know, to keep this going and to, to show and to participate, yeah, even as myself as a participant, even though I may have screen, some screen fatigue, I'll just say, okay, keep the bigger purpose in mind and, and, and I will take part, yeah. I think thanks, uh, you know, Paul, for maybe helping us to, you know, uh, draw this to a close on a very positive note. Uh, I think we, we really had a very enjoyable and energetic discussion. It's such a, I think, you know, despite our complaints about a lot of screen time, I think this has also given us a very wonderful opportunity to come together as a community and hear from various experiences um, from each of our panelists and from each other. I think we have uh, looked at and heard many column, common themes and challenges and also many inspiring stories. I, I think if I have one key takeaway, it is that the arts and cultural community is really an indomitable one. You know, we're always innovating, finding new creative solutions. As uh, many of our panelists have mentioned, you know, have the resilience, you know, to, to come together um, and find creative solutions. I, I'm sure we're all going to go away today feeling um, a lot more brave and inspired, you know, as we continue to reimagine and, uh, reinvent the future of our festivals. We look forward to many more blended festivals uh, from each of you and from many more to come. So thank you very much to our panelists and thank you to the audience for your questions and the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your questions. I think you agree that this has been a very engaging session today and we hope that you've been inspired and you've got some um, clean away some takeaways and insights as well. We would like to take this opportunity to also thank our speakers and moderator for such a, a, a wonderful session and engaging um, uh, discussions as well. And uh, this pandemic has no doubt presented challenges, but it has also accelerated you know, our digitalization and innovation in many forms. And uh, as we open doors to the new normal to embrace a digital world, you know, a, a, a hybrid model of digital and digital experiences. Okay, so we have come to the end of today's digital. In Conversation With uh, lecture. 
before you leave the session, we would appreciate it if you could uh, provide us with your feedback. Uh, you may access the feedback form via the QR code. You can scan the QR code on the screen here. And if you would like to find out more about our Culture Academy's programs, uh, you may visit cultureacademy.gov.sg to check out our past webinars and resources as well. And uh, thank you for joining us today and stay tuned for our Culture Academy's next uh, webinar uh, next month. And in the meantime, take care, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you.